Welcome to Constitutional Landmarks. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. I'm an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar, and I've appeared frequently at the Constitutional Court. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about a president who's been held to account by the Constitutional Court. He was moved from his palace to a prison. We are going to start with an extract from Acting Deputy Chief Justice Kampepe. She holds that President Zuma was liable for contempt of court and sentenced him to 15 months in jail. On 28 January 2021, the Constitutional Court handed down judgment ordering Mr. Zuma to attend the commission and give evidence before it. The judgment and order were served on Mr. Zuma, who responded by releasing a public statement in which he alleged that the commission and the constitutional court were politicizing the law to his detriment. From 15 to 19 February 2021, Mr. Zuma did not attend the commission as ordered. Accordingly, the chairperson of the commission announced that it would launch contempt of court proceedings. On the same day, Mr. Zuma published another statement in which he leveled serious criticisms against the judiciary and confirmed that he would neither obey the constitutional court's order nor cooperate with the commission in any respect. It was the applicant's case that Mr. Zuma is guilty of the crime of contempt of court his non-compliance with the court order was undeniable because he failed to attend and give evidence before the commission, and he failed to present any evidence to avoid the conclusion that his non-compliance was willful and malafide. The applicant further submitted that, in ostensibly defending his contempt, Mr. Zuma conducted a politically motivated smear campaign of the Constitutional Court the Commission and the Judiciary. According to the applicant, his tactics, coupled with his unique position, should count as aggravating factors in the determination of an approved sanction. The strength of the judiciary is being tested. I append and now hand down this judgment in response to the precarious position in which the Constitutional Court finds itself on account of a series of direct assaults, as well as calculated and insidious efforts launched by Mr. Zuma to corrode its legitimacy. After all, it is the Constitution alone that we owe our allegiance. Accordingly, we are here because we have no choice but to respond as firmly as circumstances warrant when we find our ability to uphold it besieged. Never before has the authority and legitimacy of the Constitutional Court been subjected to the kinds of attacks that Mr. Zuma has elected to launch against it and its members. Never before has the judicial process been so threatened. Furthermore, the vigor with which Mr. Zuma is peddling his disdain of the Constitutional Court and the judicial process carries the risk that he will inspire others to similarly defy court orders. Mr. Zuma has repeatedly reiterated that he would rather be imprisoned than cooperate with the commission or comply with the order made. Mr. Zuma is no ordinary litigant. He is the former president of the Republic of South Africa who continues to wield significant political influence and in whom lies a great deal of power to incite others to similarly defy court orders. His actions and any consequences or lack thereof are being closely observed by the public. So if his conduct is met with impunity, he will do significant damage to the rule of law. The unique political position that Mr. Zuma enjoys as the former president constitute a further exceptional feature of this matter that justifies a punitive sanction. No person enjoys exclusion or exemption from the sovereignty of the laws of the Republic, and Mr. Zuma is no exception. And indeed, it would be antithetical to the value of accountability if those who once held high office are not bound by the law. In fact, the Constitutional Court has in the past espoused the existence of a heightened obligation on the President 
by virtue of her or his position to conduct her or himself in a manner that accords with the con Constitution. For there are a few office bearers of greater constitutional importance than that of the President. Not only has Mr. Zuma failed to dispute the contempt of court, he has also failed to contest the degree of the contempt. Instead, he has aggravated it. The majority judgment orders an unsuspended sentence of imprisonment for a period of 15 months. This, of course, cannot adequately ca capture the damage that Mr. Zuma has done to the dignity and integrity of the judicial system. And ultimately, he owes this sentence not only in respect of violating the Constitutional Court, but to the nation he once promised to lead and to the Constitution he once vowed to uphold. If with impunity, litigants are allowed to decide which orders they wish to obey and which they wish to ignore, then our Constitution is not worth the paper on we, upon which it is written. This wasn't the first time that the Constitutional Court held President Zuma to account. The first time was in the infamous Nkundla case. President Zuma had spent 250 million rands worth of taxpayer money on his own private palace. The public protector, Tuli Madonsela, had produced a report condemning this lavish expenditure. This ultimately resulted in a case before the Constitutional Court. I spoke to the public protector's counsel, Gilbert Marcus. Let me start with the public protector who at that time was Tuli Madonsela. I don't think it's unfair to say that she was the first effective public protector in the sense that she was perfectly willing to take on the most powerful in the country, including the president himself. We overlapped, funnily enough, at the Center for Applied Legal Studies. So I, I knew her from the early 90s slightly, and then, of course, she assumed the role of public protector. She had demonstrated, I think, courage in not only the topics that she chose to engage in, but also the outcomes of her reports. The, the, the famous report was on Nkandla and the non-security improvements that the president had personally benefited from at his personal homestead in Nkandla. And there she had imposed a remedial action which was designed to determine the value of those improvements and to require him to pay them back. The economic freedom fighters chose to challenge the president's refusal to implement the remedial action directly to the constitutional court. Now, that is unusual because the circumstances in which the court itself allows direct access to it are very, very few and far between. They advanced an alternative basis, which said that this was a matter within the exclusive jurisdiction uh, of the Constitutional Court, and therefore the Constitutional Court was the only court which could hear it. But I certainly uh, represented the public protector in, in that case, and she was absolutely determined to press for the implementation of her remedial action. She, this was something that she had carefully thought through. She was backed now by a judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal, which said that this is not simply a recommendation. As the president had sought to argue uh, right until the 11th hour, and she was insistent that this was something which was binding and that had to be implemented. The case came at a peculiar time. There were two, I think, competing social forces at play. The one was that it was certainly the public protector's report was used as a stick by all the opposition parties with which to beat the president. But it also came at a time when there was increased and heightened tension between the judiciary and the executive. There had been a very high level meeting about six or seven months before the matter came to court between the heads of court and the president and the deputy president at the time, in order to deal with the judiciary's principal concern that there had been these very strident attacks on the judiciary for what was called uh, judicial overreach, trespassing into the separation of powers. And the judiciary was equally concerned with the impact of 
of attacks upon them as an institution emanating from the highest holders of political office. So it was a, a delicate time. Anyhow, the, the strategy adopted by the president on the papers, I thought was a clever strategy. He, first of all, contested whether this was a case appropriate for direct access. And secondly, he said, look, you don't have to pronounce upon the merits of this at all because the president has undertaken to implement the remedial action. So in a sense, all the squabbling about whether the public protector's powers are merely recommendatory or whether they have binding force is all academic because the president's going to implement anyhow. So what's all the fuss about? I thought that that was a, an approach which had a future. First of all, as I've explained, because the Constitutional Court is very parsimonious in dealing with cases of direct access. And secondly, because the EFF was seeking an order directing the president to pay back the money. And I think that there might well have been some judges on the Constitutional Court who felt uneasy about imposing an order of that sort, given the background of these accusations of judicial overreach and breach of the separation of powers. Anyhow, a week before the hearing, literally a week before the hearing, we received a letter on the record addressed to all the parties. It was done via the state attorney, but it was copied on the court, which was effectively proposing a settlement. It first of all, it said two things of significance. It first of all said that the president regards this matter as urgent and wants it disposed of, but he is prepared to accept the following order. And they set out an order which followed closely, but not identically, the remedial action which the public protector had imposed. So I think from a strategic point of view, those advising the president probably saw this as a good way of actually settling the matter and of avoiding a hearing in court at all. I think that they had underestimated both the EFF who were the applicants in the court and the public protector whose report was at issue because the public protector, my client, was not going to settle for anything other than the actual implementation of the actual remedial action which she had imposed and she was not prepared to allow for a tinkering with that remedial action. So the matter came to court and counsel for the president had conceded that the matter was indeed urgent and the president wanted it resolved. So the fights about direct access were effectively out the window when all the parties in the court were agreed that they wanted this finally resolved. And such squeamishness as some members of the court might have had about imposing an order on the president to pay back the money were also out the window because the president had actually tended to pay back the money. But the court was determined to hear the merits of the case. And it resulted in that uh, somewhat ringing judgment by Chief Justice Mokhweng, which I think had, a, had a, a profound impact upon the public discourse around the Zuma presidency. And so I do think it was one of those cases which entailed a rather dramatic intervention by the courts that could have been different uh, had different strategic decisions been taken. I, of course, speculate in that regard, and I certainly do not for one moment complain about the outcome because it was a very, very powerful vindication of the public protector. And I, I should tell you that having worked with uh, Tuli Madoncella, I, I don't think one should underestimate the extent to which she was personally victimized and threatened, yet stood firm in the face of overwhelming intimidation. I do think that the personality of Tuli Madoncello played a role because the papers demonstrated to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent how she had been subjected to abuse. You know, this was a long, long process before it got to court. The notion that the president had no problem with enforcing the remedial action was seen for the first time in his answering affidavit. Prior to that, there had been 
tirades, and I use the word advisedly against Tuli Madonsela in Parliament, and she had been subjected to a great deal of public abuse and, I should dare say, private abuse for the stance that she had taken. I think her personality in demonstrating how a truly independent Chapter 9 institution should perform was very important, and I think that the court rightly gave her recognition for that. What uh, role did that case play in changing the public perception of the Constitutional Court? I think it was a case which had a dramatic resonance with ordinary people, and it was because there was really very little that was complicated about the facts. You know, this was not a... I'm not saying it didn't involve technicalities and interpretive issues around the Constitution, but the underlying facts were very stark. Here was a person who had give, been given the task of doing an investigation, and here was a president who had enriched himself personally at the expense of the public. It was a, a very simple message, which the EFF very skillfully brought across. And I do want to pay particular tribute to the way Vim Trengove presented the argument. It was that stark message which was so acutely portrayed during the hearing and which came out in the judgment. And ordinary people could understand that very, very simply. It was a moral issue for want of anything else, and one which was uncluttered by technicalities. I spoke with advocate Vim Trengove about the role that he played in the case. You know, the case was launched by, not by me, but by my colleague, uh, Tembeka and Kaitobi, with the exuberance of youth. He launched this application on behalf of the EFF directly to the Constitutional Court, which was actually quite a long shot. The DA, being a bit more conservative, launched a similar application in, in the Cape High Court. But I was then asked to come in and assist on the EFF side, which I happily did. It was a wonderful occasion. We were all there in the Constitutional Court, you know, 25 advocates for all and sundry. And a very, um, a really momentous occasion, followed afterwards by, I think, a momentous judgment. We today have turned the corner. I think at the end of the day, the rule of law has won. But I think that case was probably a, a tipping point in that up to that point, the rule of law was being eroded and undermined left, right, and center. But the case and that judgment of the Chief Justice, I think, was a tipping point and started to make a difference. I just think that it happened to be at exactly the right moment that the time was right for such an intervention by the judiciary in general and the Chief Justice in particular. Of course, the judgment didn't do it on its own. There were lots of other factors. But it was, I think, an important starting point for the judiciary to take a stand to uphold the rule of law. And after the Concord judgment, many other judgments followed of that and other courts, which made a courageous stand in defense of the rule of law, and I think made a big difference to our society. Is there a sense that if you've got three different centers of power and some of the centers are failing, so if you've got a corrupt president or an incapable parliament, that the courts then need to play a much greater role uh, in yes. instances where they wouldn't have to otherwise. Yes, now I, I have no doubt that that is so. The appropriate role of the courts it depends to some extent on the in environment and the circumstances. And where, in this case, both parliament and the executive were failing and betraying their duties out of the constitution, I think there was an enhanced duty on the courts to make a stand for the constitution. And that's what happened. Of course, courts will, will tell you that they don't make a choice in either upholding the rule of law or not, and that they simply implement what the constitution requires of them. But if the truth be known, the line is often a vague one and has to be drawn by courts. And they do sometimes intend, uh, tend to do so more aggressively than others. Bear in mind that in this case were two important features. The so one is, as you mentioned, that it was a case against the president and parliament, the very peak of executive and legislative power. But the competing participant before the court was the public protector, who at that time had huge public stature 
and, and also a member of the executive branch in a broad sense. So it wasn't purely the people versus the president. They, it was a far more complex power relation before the court. And, and the fact that the public protector at that time was somebody who was so universally admired, I think helped a lot. In South Africa, often we develop these cults of personality and someone like Tuli yeah. Maranzella is universally admired. Our, our current public protector is viewed differently. Is there a concern, in other words, that this court created an exceptionally strong power for the public protector as an office and that future people that may inhabit that office may abuse that power? Yes, that risk is always there. But frankly, we already have a very powerful executive and a very powerful parliament. And all other things being equal, it serves as a valuable check that we also have at least a third repository of real power, i.e. in the public protector. All power can be abused. Our salvation lies in a distribution of powers in numerous places rather than to focus at all in parliament and the executive. And I'm right to say that her power itself can be checked through a review process. Indeed, yeah. Oh, no, that, that is so. The history of this case was that there was much uncertainty about the status and enforceability of her orders. There was a very substantial prevailing view that they didn't have any legal force at all. And in fact, at one point, President Zuma said in Parliament that her her orders had no standing and they were merely in the nature of recommendations. Well, she said at the time that was a death knell for her effectiveness because all culprits against whom she had made orders then down tools and no longer paid any attention to them. So the judgment also was a very necessary and timely one to restore the effectiveness of her own office. Can you tell us a bit about what happened on the day of the hearing? It was an unusual hearing in that a lot of the public were present, it was filmed, um, yeah. and that there was this sort of last minute concession by the president. Yeah, it was a day of high drama. And uh, the story from behind the scenes on the president's side has not yet been fully told. I can just tell you that from the other side, what happened was that this issue about the status of the public protector's orders and whether they were binding or not was a hotly debated issue over a long period of time. There were some respectable lawyers who were of the view that her, her orders had no standing at all, no legal effect at all. Cape Court had held that they had almost no standing, that those subject to her orders could ignore them if it was rational to do so, which is a very low threshold. Shortly before the Concord hearing, the Supreme Court of Appeal for the first time held that her orders were binding. So there was a countervailing authority of some substance, but the issue was now up for debate in the Constitutional Court. And the self-same president who had said in Parliament that they were in, merely at the status of a, of a recommendation, over a period of uh, days before the court made increasing concessions about their standing until on the day capitulated and conceded that they were in fact binding. Exactly how those capitulations came about, I don't know. It was very dramatic and from our side, exuberant to have the opposition capitulate. When Jeremy Gauntlet delivered that capitulation, yeah. that it seemed to have an effect of well, aimed at narrowing the damage. In other words, to say, but of course we accept that on yeah. the merits there's a problem here. Yeah. All that this court needs to determine is how much the president yeah. needs to pay. Was that an effective strategy? Well, it's hard to tell how bad it might have been if he hadn't made the concession. The president had in parliament said, these orders are mere recommendations and not binding. If he had defended that position before the constitutional court, one might have accepted that it was a good faith position held all along, albeit that it might be wrong. But having made the statement in the first place, to then concede before the hearing started that it was not correct, suggests that he never believed in what he said in the first place. But that is for him to explain. I, I can't see the advantage of making the, the capitulation but one never knows. An arguable case can be made out for the proposition that her orders have no 
binding force. It's not obvious if you read the Constitution and the Act that they have binding force. And I think that if that argument were made but not accepted, the condemnation would not have been any worse than it turned out to be. It does create a very bad impression to hold out for, what was it, a year or two, and then to arrive in court and concede that your position had been wrong all along. So, so you mentioned earlier that there were 25 advocates in court. Something like that, yeah. How much coordination happens between the parties? So the, the EFF were involved, uh, the DA was involved, uh, the public protector was represented. Very little, frankly. There is, there's a great deal of collegiality between the lawyers, of course, and we talk to one another, but there, is, there was no organized campaign of coordination at all. A far looser understanding, you argue this and I'll argue that and so on. So, so no, it was pretty much haphazard. Political parties have started to utilize the courts to run political battles because the courts provide a useful arena and maybe a more effective arena than parliament. Yes, I have no doubt my client's motives were political and not an anxious defense of the rule of law in the first place. But that is legitimately so. Not only political parties, there are lots of other interest groups come to court to advance their particular interests, but employ the law to do so. And that's a perfectly legitimate enterprise. The courts, of course, have to guard against the risk of becoming mere political instruments, but they have so far managed that very well. If you've got a client who cares about a political outcome, they may not care about winning the case, but they care about being able to express their ideas. Does that constrain or change the nature of the arguments that you'd present? At the margins, yes, not in substance. I don't argue bullshit. <laughs> so, so I make an argument or I don't. I wouldn't make a different argument or make an argument simply because the client on the day would like me to do so. But I may give my address a particular slant or a particular color if I knew that that would suit my client. You know, let me give you an example in this case. The papers which I had inherited and on which, on which I argued the case made various points of, about the illegality of the president's conduct in his, in his failure to implement the public protector's orders and how that contravened the constitution. One point that wasn't made was that by doing so, he had breached his oath of office. But I submitted to the court, as I think I was legitimately entitled to do, that not only had he breached the constitution in these various ways, but those breaches also constituted a breach of his oath of office. I mean, there's an argument that calling him a, an oath breaker ultimately led to his political demise. Did him some political damage, yes, because that seems so inimical to the duties, the constitutional duties of a of state. The normal rule is that cases should start in the High Court and from there normally go to the Supreme Court of Appeal and only ultimately to the Constitutional Court. But you can imagine that from a political perspective, it was a very unattractive route to follow because it is one that can take a year or two to, to get to the Constitutional Court. But there are very narrow grounds on which one is entitled to go directly to the Constitutional Court. One of those grounds is if the basis of the case is that the president or parliament has acted in breach of their duties under the constitution. But even that exception has been very narrowly interpreted by the courts to be confined to not just any constitutional breach, but a, a breach which is, quote, agent specific. In other words, breach of a duty which is imposed on the president in particular, not merely duties which are imposed on the executive or on anybody else. So what you need to show is that the president was in breach of a constitutional duty which the constitution imposes on him in particular or on parliament in particular. And it wasn't clear that we would succeed in persuading the constitutional court that this was such an occasion. But we did make an, an argument. Firstly, that there is a duty, and I think it's section 82 or 3 of the Constitution, which imposes specific duty on the president to uphold and defend the Constitution. And they held that that was an agent-specific duty 
which was in addition to the normal duty imposed on all of us to obey the constitution. And the second leg was that there was a duty on the on parliament in particular to hold the executive to account, which they didn't do in this case. So those two pegs gave us the license to have this case heard by the constitutional court. But I can tell you that when courts want to hear cases, they find it easier to find reasons to do so than when they don't. And I suspect that on this occasion, the constitutional court saw that it was important for them to hear the case rather than to duck it. So this was an interesting case for someone like the Chief Justice. So when he was first appointed Chief Justice, there was a lot of concern because he hadn't been at the court for very long. Yeah. There were photographs of him and Azuma having dinner together, and there was this fear that he would protect the president. The language that's used by Mukwing yeah. is b in b biblical proportions. Yeah. I mean, he talks about this um, sword of justice chopping yeah. off the rotting head of impunity. Yeah. And then he later describes the public protector as David fighting Goliath. Yeah. No, uh, that is so. It was a very potent judgment. And these days, delivered on national TV. So its impact is immeasurably greater than it would, would have been in the old days. And, and you'll remember from that time, it had a spectacular impact, that judgment. And certainly one thing one could say of this Chief Justice is that he has shown some leadership. Our tradition has always been for Chief Justices to be soft-spoken and seldom heard. But he has adopted a very upfront style of leadership, which served us well in, in hard times. The following is an extract from the Encounter Judgment, read by Justice Mahon Mahon. One of the crucial elements of our constitutional vision is to make a decisive break from the unchecked abuse of state power and resources that was virtually institutionalized during the apartheid era. To achieve this goal, we, the people of South Africa, adopted accountability, the rule of law and the supremacy of the constitution as values of our constitutional democracy. For this reason, public office bearers ignore their constitutional obligations at their peril. This is so because constitutionalism, accountability, and the rule of law constitute the sharp and mighty sword that stands ready to chop the ugly head of impunity off its different neck. If these values are not observed and their precepts not carried out conscientiously, we have a recipe for a constitutional crisis of great magnitude. The president is the head of state and head of the national executive. He is, is indeed the highest calling to the highest office in the land. He is the first citizen of this country and occupies a position indispensable for the effective governance of our democratic country. Only upon him has the constitutional obligation to uphold, defend and respect the constitution as the supreme law of the Republic being expressly imposed. The promotion of national unity and reconciliation falls squarely on his shoulders, as does the maintenance of orderliness, peace, stability, and devotion to the well-being of the Republic and all of its people. Whoever and whatever poses a threat to our sovereignty, peace, and prosperity, he must fight. The fathers and mothers of our Constitution conceived of a way to give even to the poor and marginalized a voice and teeth that could bite corruption and abuse of state power and resources excruciatingly. And that is the public protector. She is the embodiment of a biblical David that the public is, who fights the most powerful and very well resolved Goliath that impropriety and corruption by government officials are. The office of the public protector is one of the two crusaders and champions of anti-corruption and clean governance. Hairs are indeed very wide powers that leave no lever of government power above scrutiny, coincidental embarrassment in codes and censure. This is a necessary service because state resources belong to the public 
as does state power. The repositories of these resources and power to, to use them on behalf and for the benefit of the public. When this is suspected or known not to be so, then the public deserves protection and that protection has been constitutionally entrusted to the public protector. We started this episode with an extract from Justice Kampepe. In the court's original judgment, it found that President Zuma was liable for contempt of court and sentenced him to 15 months in jail. Soon after that judgment was handed down, civil unrest broke out throughout the country. For a week, targeted acts of violence were perpetrated in Kwateng and KwaZulu-Natal. They started off in the name of President Zuma on the basis that he had been wrongfully imprisoned. Soon after this, he brought an application for rescission of the Constitutional Court's judgment. Justice Kampepe delivered judgment in that rescission application as follows. Today, the Constitutional Court hands down judgment in an application brought by former President Jacob Gelee Felix Azuma, in which he asked the court to rescind and set aside the judgment and order it handed down on 29 June 2021. In terms of that order, Mr. Zuma was found guilty of contempt of court for his failure to comply with an earlier order of the Constitutional Court and was sentenced to direct imprisonment for a period of 15 months. I should explain that, of course, whilst an order of the Constitutional Court cannot be appealed, our law does make provision for an order, even one of the Constitutional Court, to be rescinded in narrow circumstances, where, for example, it can be proven that the order was made in a party's absence and that an error was made by the court that granted it. Mr. Zuma submitted that the order was granted in his absence since he had not participated in the proceedings, which he averred was justified given that he could not have been expected to comply with the order that required him to appear before a commission of inquiry that he felt was biased against him. He alleged errors in the granting of the order, which include that the Commission sought an order securing his imprisonment by way of motion proceedings, rather than seeking to ensure his attendance at the Commission by invoking the Commission's Act, that the Constitutional Court took account of his public statements, which constituted TSA evidence, that the court targeted him with an exceptionally harsh tailor-made sanction and that acting Justice Belay, with whom he took issue, formed part of quorum in condemned proceedings. All of the above, he averred that he was summarily sentenced without a trial and without being afforded an opportunity to advance mitigation after his conviction. Finally, he concluded it would be in the interest of justice for it to be rescinded and set aside. Far from persuaded by Mr. Zuma's submissions, the majority finds that although Mr. Zuma's physical absence cannot be disputed, Mr. Zuma was given notice of the contempt of court proceedings launched against him. He knew of the relief the commission sought. Despite this, he elected not to participate. The majority emphatically reject any suggestion that litigants can be allowed to butcher of their own will, judicial process which in all respects has been carried out with the utmost degree of regularity, only to later plead to the absent victim. Elected absence, like that of Mr. Zuma, constitute more than litigious skullduggery which does not have the effect of turning a, com a competently granted order into one erroneously granted. It is quite simply not for these sorts of circumstances that the law of rescission caters. Mr. Zuma declined to participate in the contempt proceedings and disdainfully dismissed a further opportunity when invited to do so. He only attempts to justify his absence now that the shoe pinches. The majority emphasizes that the interest of justice requires the Constitutional Court to protect the principle of finality in litigation. 
It is precisely to protect this principle that orders of the Constitutional Court are immune from appeal. It would fly in the face of the interest of justice for a party to be allowed to willfully refuse to participate in litigation and then expect the opportunity re to reopen the case when it suits them. The hands of the Constitutional Court are bound, and Mr. Zuma himself bound them. It must, of course, be emphasized that rescission is an avenue of legal recourse, remains open, but only to those who advance meritorious and bona fide applications and who have not, at every turn of the page, sought to abuse judicial process. On a conspectus of all of the above, the conclusion of the majority of the Constitutional Court reaches is that this application falls to be dismissed with cost. A few days before Justice Kampepe delivered this judgment, President Zuma was released on medical parole. Two cases have already been launched to review that decision and send him back to prison. I hope you enjoyed the inaugural episode of Constitutional Landmarks. Throughout this series, I'm going to be interviewing some of the greatest advocates that have ever appeared in the Constitutional Court. I will also be speaking to the judges that authored some of the court's landmark decisions. We'll be speaking about gay marriage, the death penalty, free speech, and a range of other exciting issues.